morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to AP U.S. History. As we look at the circumstances of black people in America in the early 20th century, when according to the Supreme Court, society must be, could be separate, but must be equal. And for all the things changing in America in the late 1800s, for black people, especially in the South, things stayed pretty much the same. And almost as soon as Reconstruction ended, um, the new freedoms that black people uh, in the South had supposedly gained began to vanish. And throughout the South, all of this was a process lasting a couple of decades. Um, what were known as Jim Crow laws, kind of modified from the old black codes and older slave codes, began to reappear um, to separate white and black people socially, um, and to keep black people from exercising many of their new rights. For example, voting restrictions became common. One common form of voting restriction was the poll tax, um, in which you had to pay a fee to register to vote. These taxes were usually not extremely large, um, but even a small tax could be enough to keep um, poor people from voting. Of course, most black people in the South were poor. Even a small tax would make it hard to vote. This had the added benefit of keeping poor white people from voting, who might have pushed um, for political leadership to change, too. Although, if there were poor people you wanted to vote, you might just pay for their poll tax. And this was one way Southern machine politics sometimes worked. Um, local machines paying the poll tax of people they wanted to vote and then telling them how to vote. Um, indeed, in Memphis, um, Boss Crump made sure black people could vote as long as they voted for, uh, for Crump's candidates. In exchange, they got parks and schools and slightly better public services than black people in many parts of the South, as long as they did what Crump said. And by that, he controlled Tennessee for decades. Another form of voting restriction were literacy tests in which to register to vote, you had to prove you could read. And to be fair, many black people couldn't read because many didn't get an education or much of an education. Likewise, poor white people often couldn't read that well either. Um, but even with that said, literacy tests were often unfair. White and black people might be given different things to read. Um, and black people a much harder test to see if they understood it. Others um, did not require a lot of reading, but required complex and tricky things to read. And if you were black, your test was graded by somebody who hated you. So this was another way um, black people were often kept from voting in the South. And um, while well, right after the Civil War, white people and black people in the South did mix some. Um, by the late 1800s, segregation. Um, was being becoming entrenched in the South, separating white and black people um, into different facilities. This was challenged in the courts um, and other ways, um, as black people objected to having to attend different schools, ride in different railroad cars, drink from different water fountains, use different bathrooms, use different sections in hospitals and theaters and churches and hotels, if they could stay in hotels at all. Um, even zoos and public swimming pools were segregated, with white people going on some days and black people on others, if black people got to go at all. But the most famous challenge to this system was the Supreme Court case of Plessy versus Ferguson. In Homer Plessy, um, in not being as really pictured there, but being a very pale-skinned black man, only one-eighth black, but by law, fully black, bought a ticket to try to ride in a white railroad car in Louisiana, um, announced his race, and was arrested. The Supreme Court in 1896 um, threw out his challenge to that segregation law, um, saying as long as the railroad cars were of equal quality, it was okay if they were separate. Um, so seven to one, with one judge absent, the Supreme Court set up the principle of separate but equal a decision that would um, stand for decades, not being fully overturned until the 1960s. Um, although it would be chipped away at a bit here and there in the early and mid 20th century. And black people dealt with this in various ways. 
Booker T. Washington, um, who had been born a slave in Alabama, um, saw education and job skills as the best way um, out of poverty and discrimination. He helped to found the Tuskegee Institute in Alabama to train black people in some professions, like to become teachers themselves, um, or in skilled trades, plumbers, carpenters, bricklayers, the kind of jobs that would have made them welcome in the American Federation of Labor if they actually took black people. His view was that with a skilled trade, a black person could get off the farm, get a decent job in a city, um, and gradually earn economic equality. And from there, he said, um, then social and political equality would follow. But at first, it was about making a good living in a practical sense. Um, all he wanted for now, he said, was for black people to get a fair chance to work at a good job, which was criticized um, by some other black leaders, describing this as the Atlanta Compromise. Because he famously laid out this idea at a, at a speech um, at a World's Fair in Atlanta um, in 1895. He said it was wrong for white people to ignore the injustices of black people, but he also accepted things were different for now. It was pointless to demand full equality. He did want the chance to earn economic equality. And as a bonus, he said to white Southerners, if you'll just hire black people, you won't have to hire a bunch of Italians or other immigrants. So there's a little bit of room for racism, um, even there. Um, but again, there were those who criticized this. Although plenty who welcomed it, Booker T. Washington became the first black man invited to visit the White House since Frederick Douglass, when Theodore Roosevelt had him to dinner. Um, although faced so much uh, backlash from that, he said he wasn't doing that again. In the term Atlanta compromise, again, very much in the negative sense of compromising one's values, was a term invented by W.E.B. Du Bois, um, a black man from Massachusetts um, with a Ph.D. from Harvard, um, who, of course, did face discrimination in the North, but growing up in Boston was not quite the same, same as growing up a slave in Virginia. Um, so Booker T. Washington said that perhaps Du Bois didn't fully understand what he was talking about when he criticized Washington for being willing to compromise. But he did criticize him for being willing to accept social and political discrimination. And he laid out some of that criticism of Washington and a lot of criticism of American society and the U.S. government in a book called The Souls of Black Folk, which he published in 1903, saying the problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line, and the color line being a term often used for the separation between white and black society. In this book, he traced the history of discrimination in America from the end of the Civil War to the 20th century, blaming a lot of it on the failure of the Freedmen's Bureau to really help black people after the Civil War, blaming the national government um, for not fulfilling, as he saw it, its moral obligation to former slaves after the war. Um, he criticized what he saw as the materialism of people like Booker T. Washington, who would be satisfied with a good job and not ask for more. Um, and the book also describes some parts of, uh, of black culture, especially black religion and music. And Du Bois said African Americans should not compromise. They should demand full equality in all ways, right away. And it was the duty of the nation as a whole to make sure they got it. Another black southerner, or black person, who spoke out um, against discrimination was Ida B. Wells, or sometimes known as Ida Wells Barnett, um, having a hyphenated name after her marriage. She was born in Mississippi, but moved to Memphis, Tennessee as an adult, where she wrote for a black-owned newspaper in Memphis. Um, and after friends of hers were attacked by a mob in 1899, she began to write about lynching in the South. Although lynching did take place in the North as well, and while it often targeted black people, it sometimes targeted immigrants or others. Um, 
Italians, Asians, and Jews being the main targets. Um, eventually, she criticized lynching to such an extent that she was run out of Memphis and moved to Chicago, um, where she remained active in um, pushing for more rights for black people and for women. Ray Stannard Baker, in 1908, um, published Following the Color Line uh, in examining race relations in the United States, focusing once again on the issue of lynching, trying to open Northerners' eyes to this issue that was mostly a Southern problem, all again it did happen in the North too. And it continued to be a problem, despite many campaigns against it. Um, and while lynching was, of course, illegal, um, because you can't just grab somebody and hang him, um, Southern law enforcement usually turned a blind eye to it, so that there was pressure from some Northerners to create anti-lynching laws. Um, but the uh, but this was not even introduced in Congress until 1918. Um, and was introduced unsuccessfully, Southern senators consistently blocked anti-lynching laws that would have allowed federal agents to go into the South to investigate lynchings that were not prosecuted by local law enforcement. And some Northern and Western Democrats also blocked anti-lynching laws to keep Southern Democrats um, as Democrats. In 1905, W.E.B. Du Bois, a number of other um, African Americans wanting full civil rights right away met at Niagara Falls. Um, meeting, by the way, on the Canadian side, for one thing, the view is better, but also no hotel in New York would let them stay there. And they just called themselves the Niagara Movement. Um, and they felt, as Du Bois had already said, that Booker T. Washington's plan of gradual progress was degrading. Slow, essentially a sellout. They're too materialistic. Um, du Bois said that Booker T. Washington's approach could create workers, but it cannot make men. All again, Washington felt it was pretty easy for Du Bois to take that attitude up in Massachusetts. He might feel differently if he lived in Virginia or Alabama. And only a few hundred people ever joined this Niagara movement. On its own, it didn't accomplish that much, except that it would be an inspiration for one of the most important groups to work for black civil rights that was formed just a few years later, with many of the Niagara movement's members as founders of another group, which was inspired by events in 1908. In Springfield, Illinois, um, Two black men were imprisoned. One was accused of rape, another, um, another of attempted rape and murder. Um, they were imprisoned, as you should imprison someone accused of those things. But while they were going to go to trial, a number of white people in Springfield felt that would take too long. They wanted to break into the jail and just kill them right there. The local sheriff, with the help of a local white restaurant owner, heard this was coming, managed to sneak the two black men out of town, to a jail somewhere out in the country. Discovering the black men had been um, gotten away, the mob decided to just uh, riot and general destroy the black part of town. We think of race riots today, at any point since about 1965, we tend to think of black people getting mad about mistreatment, often police brutality, um, real or alleged, and in rioting. But traditionally, a race riot involved white people getting mad at something black people had done, or allegedly done, and destroying the black part of town, which is what happened in the Springfield race riots of 1908. A riot that um, killed seven people, injured many others, um, and um, of course did a lot of property damage. Incidentally, the two men were later put on trial. Um, the one accused of rape was proven to be innocent, the woman he had allegedly raped had, uh, had a venereal disease that he did not have, so uh, they concluded that she got around. The man accused of attempted rape and murder confessed to actually stabbing the guy who he had allegedly stabbed um, and was hanged. But this was following what were probably fair trials. Now, obviously, members of the Niagara Movement and other people supporting civil rights 
didn't, you know, he wouldn't like a race riot and the murder of seven black people anywhere. But there was something particularly awful to them um, about this happening in Springfield, Illinois. So who's the most famous person to come from Springfield, Illinois? Abraham Lincoln, um, who, uh, had he been alive, would have turned 99 earlier that year. And so for this to happen in the home of Lincoln seemed particularly um, terrible. And so the next year, 1909, a group of both white and black reformers formed the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, often known as the NAACP for short. Um, to try to help black people get better jobs, better education, equal rights in general. Um, you know, for major things like equal employment, equal education, but even the things that might not seem that big, but that add up. Um, and in, for example, to the common use of racial slurs. Um, and many things were once part of common everyday language. That we simply don't hear anymore and people might even be shocked at. Um, have you ever bought a can of mixed nuts or been given one as a gift? Oh, good. Um, if you've got a good can, it's like with real nuts, not like peanuts or cashews, neither of which is technically a nut. Um, in a good can, what's that big nut that kind of floats to the top before you open it? Great big brown nut. Bigger than a walnut. Got a whole country named after it, in fact. Bigger than macadamia. Big and brown. The Brazil nut. It's the proper name for this, but for uh, but for a long time, at least in some places, they were commonly known too, more or less, as a Negro toe. Oh, I didn't use the word Negro. It's the common name for that nut. Now, when uh, when you were a kid, if you had to pick between multiple things that were about the same, you ever do any mean mighty mo? What's what's next? Any mean mighty mo? Catch a tiger by the yeah, catch a tiger by the toe. So it used to be it didn't be a tiger. Um, but if he hollers, let him go. I heard a compromise once from an older person who caught a monkey by the toe. I don't. I'd only heard tiger in the past. He said, "Why do you say monkey?" He said, "Well, I'm not saying the other thing because for her that was what she immediately thought of. It was what she heard growing up." Um, the NAACP, um, like a good progressive group, which in many ways they were began publishing their own magazine called The Crisis, which is still published today. A magazine um, dealing with issues of interest to African Americans, political, cultural, um, and so forth. Um, and again, it's still published today. Um, and as, in many ways, a progressive middle class group, while the NAACP did want full equality right away, they did have to work for it in the end gradually, but the way middle class Americans do uh, when they feel mistreated, specifically by suing. The NAACP would use the court system to try to get better treatment. Technically, the rule was separate but equal. So the NAACP would go to court repeatedly over the 20th century to demonstrate that specific cases of segregation, while separate, were definitely not legal, slowly chipping away um, at that doctrine one case at a time. Um, but as kind of a middle class group, the NAACP um, it didn't always look at practical day-to-day -day issues. And so in 1911, black workers in big cities formed the Urban League to focus on their needs, um, to help um, poor African Americans buy clothes, to help them get their children into school, to help them find jobs. Um, and of course, both the NAACP and the Urban League are still active. And other groups wanted to uh, get better treatment as well. Um, again, Jewish people in America um, face discrimination of various types as well. Um, in, in some places, people who bought a house would sign an agreement that if they ever resold it, they would not resell it to a Jewish person or a black person or an Italian or many other groups, too. Um, some places refused to hire Jewish people. Many clubs refused to accept Jewish members. Um, and Jewish people faced violence, too. 
Jews were among the people attacked alongside African Americans in the Springfield race riots. And so in 1913, the Anti-Defamation League was formed, then to try to uh, protect Jewish people from violence and discrimination, and then also from racial slurs. Um, has anybody ever played Scrabble? Yeah. That's good. Um, if, um, what was the thing prior, what was the organization called? Oh, the Anti-Defamation League. Um, yeah. when, when you play Scrabble, um, if there's a challenge to a word, maybe you use the official Scrabble dictionary to look it up. Some people just use other dictionaries, but there is an official Scrabble dictionary. Um, and it has gone through a number of editions over the years, um, typically adding more words so people can get more points. I think they're up to the sixth edition today. But occasionally they have removed things from the official dictionary as well. Um, for example, when they switched from the second edition to the third edition of the Scrabble dictionary, they removed slang, uh, slang terms for body parts and also most of the racial slurs. In the second edition, um, Jew was included as a verb. Um, Why do they include the verb? To Jew, someone is to cheat it. Or at least that was once a common term. One in a course of Jewish people would prefer not to be used. And of course, Asian Americans also faced discrimination, um, primarily on the West Coast. Um, the Chinese Exclusion Act um, had made immigration by Chinese almost impossible since 1882. But after Japan opened up to the world, many Japanese people moved to America and to other parts of the world too. Um, but just as Californians had worried about the influence of Chinese people, um, they now came to worry about the Japanese as well, describing in first the uh, First the Chinese, seen here, and later the Japanese, as the Yellow Peril. Um, <coughs> and worrying they would take their jobs, um, undermine American culture, maybe even serve as spies for the Japanese Empire. And so just as Ca um, Chinese people had seen their rights limited, California in particular soon began trying to limit the rights of Japanese people in America too. For example, in San Francisco, as they rebuilt following the Great Fire of 1906, um, they segregated the schools and said that Japanese school children would have to go to separate schools from white people, which of course they saw as deeply insulting. They didn't want to go to school alongside black people and Chinese and Mexicans, the Japanese viewing themselves as superior to all other races. And this was viewed not just as an offense against local Japanese people, but an insult to the entire empire of Japan, who complained to President Theodore Roosevelt. Um, finally, Theodore Roosevelt, uh, quite a bit of help from, at this point, his Secretary of War, William Howard Taft, worked out an agreement with Japan. Um, kind of an unofficial agreement they described as a gentleman's agreement. Under this agreement, um, the U.S. government would ensure um, that Japanese Americans had the same rights as white people. Um, in particular, they would not have to attend segregated schools. They could go to the white schools in California. But um, to kind of balance this out, Japan agreed to uh, mostly stop any more people from moving to Japan to the United States. Um, with the exception of, of Hawaii, uh, where we wanted them to work on the sugar and pineapple plantations. Um, so, then there'd be some li it would limit Japanese immigration to the U.S. voluntarily. In return, the U.S., um, in principle, would protect the rights of Japanese people in America. Now, whereas the Chinese Exclusion Act had completely excluded people coming from China, there were ways for people to come from Japan to the United States. Family could come, for example. And so a custom developed um, of men in America marrying picture brides from Japan. Now, arranged marriages were already um, typical in Japan. But in this case, um, a marriage would be arranged by family living in Japan between a woman living in Japan and a man living in America. Um, he would be sent... They would communicate by mail. He would get a picture 
of the woman he was marrying at a distance. And once they were officially married, she was then part of his family and could move to join him in the United States. And the first time he might meet his wife was when she got off the boat. Um, was a way around the gentleman's agreement. Um, a formal agreement was created a year after this, the Root Takahira Agreement in 1908, in which Japan and the United States agreed to recognize each other's territorial claims in the Pacific. Japan, by this point, had recently taken over Taiwan and Korea, and we said that's fine. They had built up a sphere of influence in China, and that's their business. All they did promise to respect the idea of the open door in China. And, of course, they promised not to mess with, say, Hawaii or the Philippines for now. Um, so, building on more international diplomacy, all despite this gentleman's agreement, Japanese people in America did not always um, get fair treatment even after that. In 1913, California passed a law saying only American citizens could own land. Um, and if Asian immigrants um, could be excluded from citizenship. Um, and so typically didn't become citizens. Well, this might have affected anybody. The real point was to seize farmland belonging to Japanese or Chinese people living in America. Except, under the Constitution, there is one thing that guarantees American citizenship, and what is that? Well, you can have a child in America, it doesn't make you a citizen, but who is? Would be born in America. Your child would be a citizen. If you were born in the United States, with a few very, very, very limited exceptions for like diplomats, if you're born in America, you are a U.S. citizen. Um, except, of course, for American Indians in those days. Um, and so, many people who'd immigrated from Japan or China had had children in America. And so some people put huge farms in the name of their children. So an eight-year-old might own a huge rice plantation in central California because he was a citizen uh, and California couldn't seize his land. In, uh, in the Southwest. Mexican-Americans tried to form groups to promote their rights, but the ones, the groups formed in the early 1900s didn't last that long, and they certainly had complaints. Their land was sometimes seized in the Southwest. Um, Mexican-Americans were often forced to sign long-term labor contracts, just like those forced on black workers in the South. Although in 1911, the Supreme Court outlawed labor contracts, at least for Hispanic people in the Southwest, for black people in the South, they could continue to uh, be forced into labor contracts. But some change did take place. Um, example, um, one example is Octaviano Lara Zola. Um, he was born in the state of Chihuahua in Mexico, but lived most of his life in New Mexico and served one term as governor of the state of New Mexico, although they did not let him run for a second term because he had supported women's suffrage, and that was viewed as a little bit too controversial. But that didn't end his career. At the age of 70, he was elected to the U.S. Senate, making him the first Hispanic American to serve in the U.S. Senate. And there's one group who, uh, when things are going right, didn't see it happen for them. If things were going wrong, they got it worse. Even for American Indians, things were changing a bit. Um, in, some American Indians tried to push for more rights, even formed a few civil rights groups of their own, which again didn't last long, but did end up seeing some limited success. Um, so that in 1924, at long last, the Indian Citizenship Act declared American Indians um, to be U.S. citizens and that they had the right to vote in national elections. While they were still often prevented from voting in local and state elections, a law recently passed in North Dakota, for example, requires you to have a street address in order to register to vote, but on Indian reservations, streets often don't have names, houses don't have numbers, making it hard to register your street address, um, even today. <laughs>